Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this rapid response webinar, analysing the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction treaty. Organised by the British Institute of International Comparative Law, I'm Jack Kenny. I'm a research fellow in international law here and uh, the convener of this event. If you enjoy this session and you'd like to find out more about similar events, I'd like to uh, say it's possible to go to our website and you can navigate to the events section and find uh, things that may be of interest. It's also planned for there to be a, a, a report which I'll write at the end of this event, which will be published and circulated online. Without anything further, I would like to welcome our chair for this event, Fernanda Millerke. Fernanda's extremely experienced in this area. She's currently permanent representative of Argentina to the International Maritime Organization, formerly legal advisor of the permanent mission of Argentina to the UN. In 2011, chair of the G77 and China in Law of the Sea negotiations and co-chair of the UN regular process for the global reporting and assessment of the state of the marine environment, including socioeconomic aspects and negotiated BBNJ on behalf of the G77 and China until 2015. So welcome, Fernanda, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jack, and, and thanks to uh, Bickle for this uh, very kind invitation to me. Um, it is uh, a great honor to share uh, this uh, panel with uh, great presenters. Just as a um, brief introduction, everybody is aware that last March, uh, the intergovernmental conference that negotiated the BBNJ agreement, uh, uh, an agreement on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, finalized a text that will be adopted later on this year. You might remember that everything, I mean, this negotiation started in 2011. That was a big year for BBNJ when the package of negotiation was agreed. Uh, 2016 and 2017, there was a prep call, a preparatory conference uh, before an intergovernmental conference was convened by the General Assembly. And this intergovernmental conference had sessions from 2018. It was interrupted during the pandemic and finalized this work last March. So what is the big package? In, and this has to do with the presentations of today. The package means on the one hand conservation, and the other is sustainable use of marine biodiversity. Our speakers are going to be more concrete about this. So two presentations that we're going to have, the first two are going to go straight into the core of the package. The other two are of, uh, let's say, a, a different, well, touch upon different nuances. One is a systemic issue, which is compliance and dispute settlement. And the last one is going to be more specific, just the implications of this agreement to the Arctic. So it is a great honor to introduce to you the four speakers in the order they will speak. Lydia Slobodian from Georgetown Law. She will be speaking on the common heritage of mankind and its relationship to the principle of equity. Professor Master Marcel Jaspers from the University of Aberdeen will be speaking on marine genetic resources as part of the BBNJ Treaty. Dr. Ephemius Papastavridis from the University of Oxford will be speaking on the implementation and enforcement as well as dispute settlement. And finally, Professor Yoshishumi Tanaka of the University of Copenhagen who will be speaking on the implications of the new BBNJ agreement on Arctic Ocean governance. Um, a little bit of um, uh, domestic announcements. Uh, the speakers will speak for 10 minutes. We understand that one of the speakers will uh, be accompanied by a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I will try to be tied to um, the 10 minutes, so make an effort, please. At the end of all four presentations, 
if we have time, and I hope we will have time, uh, we will take questions and then we invite uh, attendees to type their questions in the chat box. So we will make an effort to have some time for uh, questions and answers. So with this, uh, Lydia, would you like to go first, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Fernanda. Um, and thank you for inviting me to join this uh, webinar. Um, it's such a, a, a wonderful time to be working in international environmental law and be able to talk about this new um, agreement that we have come to on the text of this very important treaty. I want to talk, start by talking about one of the issues that I think um, really gets to the heart of uh, some of the struggles that we've had to govern areas beyond national jurisdiction. And it's certainly been playing out throughout the, the entire negotiation since the very beginning in the early 2000s. And that is, what is the legal status of the high seas? Or who has rights to the, the resources um, of, the, of the high seas? And to start answering this question, you need to first have, have a bit of a sense of um, the different maritime zones that are set up in areas beyond national jurisdiction and in the um, ocean areas. So the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea divides the ocean into different areas based on who has rights and what kind of sovereign uh, jurisdiction applies. Um, the territorial sea, um, is the area right next to the coast. Beyond that, up to 200 nautical miles from the coast is the exclusive economic zone. Up to there, we're really within national jurisdiction. Beyond national jurisdiction is where things start to get a little bit tricky. So the um, water column, the watery bit from 200 nautical miles out to the, the open ocean is considered the high seas. However, the, um, the, the seabed and the subsoil is under a different regime. Uh, it's termed the area. And there is a provision for an extended continental shelf, so this is not exactly accurate. But the essential division is that we have a different legal regime that applies to the water column, the watery bit, and the, the seabed. And that creates problems. Um, that division is not based on science. That division is not based on what makes legal sense. And not, it's not based on any logistics or, or, or technical benefits. It's based on negotiation. And it has given rise to this issue of competing principles. So the area and its resources under the Unconventional Law of the Sea um, is governed by the common heritage of humankind, mankind in the UN Convention, but we got humankind in this agreement to be a little bit more um, gender inclusive. So the common heritage of humankind uh, is a, a legal uh, term. It has certain implications. If a resource is common heritage, it means that it is not subject to appropriation. Uh, it is not subject to claims of state sovereignty. I can't go out and plant my flag and say, I claim this area of the seabed for the United States. I cannot do that. Um, it is reserved for peaceful uses and purposes. Um, it is subject to freedom of access and freedom of scientific research. And there is a requirement that I can use those resources, right? Like I can't claim them. I can't say the United States now owns this area and these resources, but I can, can go out and take these resources and use them, but I have to do so sustainably. And it's subject to equitable sharing of benefits because essentially we're saying these resources, they don't belong to any individual state. They can't belong to any individual person. They belong to humankind as a whole. And so their use has to benefit humankind as a whole. Well, the, I mean, this, is, this is wonderful, right? It's, it's a great regime. The, the problem is it's not clear from the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea to what extent this regime applies to biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. First, it seems to be limited to the area, so the, the seabed, and not the water column, not the watery bit. And of course, we know that, that biodiversity, you know, it doesn't like to... to respect these jurisdictional boundaries that we put in place. Um, it doesn't necessarily stay on the seabed for its entire life. It's not always clear what is seabed and what is biodiversity, or sorry, what is water column when you are um, interrogating the, the habitats of these, um, these species. 
But the other issue is even if we say that the area, the, the seabed is common heritage, it's not clear from the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea um, whether that includes the biological resources in the area or whether it only includes the mineral resources. Um, and this is because the, the exact wording that it uses is the area and its resources are common heritage of humankind. And then elsewhere, um, the convention defines resources to mean mineral resources. So some argue, well, that's fine. We still have the area is common heritage of humankind. So we're just saying the area and its mineral resources that doesn't exclude bi biological resources. Others have argued, no, it does exclude biological resources. It's clearly narrow defined, narrowly defined to mean mineral resources. So that that controversy is not is not resolved. That different um, countries do have different positions on that uh, still. So if it's not common heritage, what is it? Um, well, the watery bit, the, the high seas, is subject to the principle of freedom of the high seas. Freedom of the high seas um, does allow appropriation of resources, um, and it does not have that requirement for benefit sharing. So this question of are these resources of the area um, and the high seas, are they common heritage resources or are they subject to freedom of the high seas? This question has really been at the heart of a lot of the discussions that we've had um, throughout the negotiation of this agreement from the very first uh, discussions about a potential agreement back in the early 2000s. This debate has been ongoing. In the negotiations themselves, this debate became enmeshed with a debate about the principle of equity. And, and as an international environmental lawyer, this was very interesting because normally in international environmental law, when we talk about equity, we're talking about intergenerational equity or intragenerational equity. So intergenerational equity is our obligations to um, future generations, future people unborn, either near future or distant future. And intragenerational equity describes the need for equity among living generations, that is among developed and developing countries and among uh, wealthier and more marginalized communities within those countries. In the negotiations, however, this principle of equity, it wasn't clear that it was referring to intergenerational or intragenerational equity. It was being used, it, almost conflated with um, the concept of the fair and equitable sharing of benefits. So there was a lot of discussion, not just in the room, but also on social media, about how sharing of benefits was a matter of equity, um, equity in its more dictionary sense rather than its legal sense, in its more fundamental sense of um, we need to ensure equity among uh, among humans and among nations. And the way to do that is to ensure sharing of benefits. So I, I, I think where it came out um, is very interesting. I was, from the very beginning, I was not expecting common heritage of humankind to get into this agreement. Um, I, I fully expected that we would end up with a practical solution to the benefit sharing questions and reasonable requirements for conservation and sustainable use. Um, but I did not expect the principle itself to get in. And it did. It did at the very last uh, minute, uh, functionally, we were able, well, beyond the last minute, like 20 hours beyond when we were supposed to stop negotiating, uh, we did come to an agreement on the common heritage of humankind in the text of this agreement. And we also got the principle of equity in there. So we, in the principle section of the agreement, um, it includes the principle of equity and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits. Now, I think the formulation of both of these in the agreed text is very interesting. The principle of equity and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits. I don't know what that means. And I think a lot of, I've, I've talked to other negotiators, and, and I think there is some uh, intentional vagueness in this framing. Fair and equitable sharing of benefits, we know what that means. Um, we have experience of that from the Nagoya Protocol. The principle of equity in this context does this include the principles of intergenerational and intragenerational equity? Um, is it referring to equity in a broader sense? I think there's going to be a lot of interesting legal discussion about what this means. And then the way the principle of the common heritage of humankind uh, got in is also very interesting because it says the principle of common heritage of humankind, which is set out in the convention. And negotiators have told me that this was intended in part to preserve the controversy, that controversy from the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, where some 
states hold that uh, common heritage applies only to the mineral resources and others hold that it applies to all living resources um, in, the, uh, in the area or even in the water column as well. Now, I'm not sure it does that. I'm not sure it does preserve the controversy. This is, I'll, I'll end on this. And I think it comes down to one word, one word and a comma. And that word is which. And in a previous version, it said the principle of common heritage of humankind that is set out in the convention. And I think that preserves the controversy. I think that's very clear. It's saying the principle of common heritage to the extent that it is set out in the convention. I think which, that word which, opens the door a little bit to an expanded interpretation of common heritage of humankind. That is that you could argue that even though the convention restricts common heritage to mineral resources, if you follow that interpretation, you could still ascribe to an interpretation that this new treaty um, could potentially expand this principle of common heritage of humankind to all resources beyond national jurisdiction. Okay, I will close there. Thank you very much, Lydia. Uh, happy to entertain that conversation in, in the question and answer uh, section. Maybe you for, for that section, you can think of, uh, maybe uh, you can expand the interpretations through Article 143, put for thought. Um, with this, uh, thank you, Lydia, again. We go to Professor Marcel Jaspers of Aberdeen. And please go ahead, Professor, with Marine Genetic Resources. The floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak here today. As um, indicated, I am not a lawyer. I am a scientist. And hopefully, um, I've had enough, enough experience of working in this particular treaty for almost uh, 10 years now. Um, to be able to get some insight into what happened on the MGR section of the treaty. Uh, so the process I'm involved in, uh, which the MGR discussion was about, was the process of bioprospecting or biodiscovery, where by some process of sampling and obtaining of bioresources, uh, you obtain some kind of new materials, which may have properties in uh, medicine or in, as enzymes for the um, processing of uh, materials in industry. And through that process of discovery and commercialization, you get a product that can be put on the market uh, at a profit. Uh, however, we have to take issue with the word bioprospecting uh, because the bioresource is often not mined. The idea is taken from nature and replicated by different means. So it's an important a distinction between uh, what you might think and what is actually happening. So we don't tend to oversample uh, the bioresources at all. It's a small sample that's taken to develop a new product based on the ideas from that. Um, so the kind of things you might think of are uh, medicines, for instance, here, antiviral medicines. Um, you have, for instance, more recently, discovery of drugs against um, coronavirus, enzymes used for uh, DNA replication, um, and other bio biochemical tools and biological tools. And the global market of marine biotechnology is roughly $12 billion, expected to be by 2025. But what we don't have is any information on the BBMJ share. So this is a real, really big issue. And there's no baseline data available at the moment. Uh, there is work um, tendered by the EU for that to be uh, found out and, and to be basically published by the beginning of 2024. So we should have some baseline data by early 2024 on the size of the market from BBNJ. Now, again, in the package deal, as Lydia already referred to, there's this issue of the sharing of benefits, which is the most contentious part. Um, and the issue, again, is, is both on the side of the fact that there is uh, both monetary and non-monetary benefit sharing. And secondly, that this issue, of course, of uh, jurisdictions and that the organisms themselves uh, that were involved here move both between the area and the high seas, as well as between uh, essentially Nagoya Protocol and uh, UNCLOS or the new BBNJ Treaty. So it's actually quite challenging to understand uh, how you would deal with the, the boundary uh, conditions. But again, uh, the new treaty at least is consistent with what Nagoya is, um, is doing. So again, hopefully there will be some uh, concordance between the two treaties. Uh, the other issue that's really clear uh, is different, and this was really hard at the beginning um, to get across as a scientist, that the, uh, the, the bilateral relationship in Nagoya um, is a contractual relationship, whereas on the other side, the DMJ agreement, of course, is multilateral. Every country has the right to access uh, MGR uh, of areas beyond national jurisdiction. And again, that takes a very different mindset. I, I'm very pleased, as Lydia pointed out, that this 
whole concept of common heritage of humankind has been included and the principle of equity has been included. Um, the kind of proposals we made early on uh, as scientists uh, are recorded in a paper which is called Myogenetica, which is an open access publication. Um, and that idea of having an obligatory uh, electronic notification has still been included in the treaty. And that means that because it's facilitated access rather than permit access, uh, you share the information about what you're doing, when you're doing it, and where you're doing it uh, before you go out on a research cruise. Um, and at that point, once you have the materials collected, you update your, um, your, your materials online. And again, then you have the ability to share the samples and the data. This idea of an exclusivity period, I don't think it's been included in the final uh, version of the treaty. And at that point, the idea uh, in 2018 was to be able to allow you to update your um, record online to say, well, we've applied for a patent, we published a paper. And some of the elements of that still remain in the current uh, treaty text. And then there was the idea at the time of having the monetary benefit sharing royalties uh, to be paid on commercialization at a fixed percentage by sector. And again, something of that type is being included in the treaty in terms of having uh, monetary benefit sharing decided, uh, in this case, based on a um, assessed contribution, and then perhaps later on based on this type of model. And again, if you're interested in this paper, um, it's easy to find if you just type in the, the keywords. So what happened? Um, we already discussed this, really. And the main issue was that the IGC-5 did not conclude uh, to finalize treaty text. And the main issues, I think, at that time were the, the lack of, of progress on marine genetic resources and the question of sharing on benefits. Ideas were, um, uh, ideas were proposed, but perhaps too late in the weeks of um, uh, in last August. Whereas this, this time around, uh, the issues were still there very much. And those were the definitions of MGR and, and various other um, things like biotechnology, uh, deriv derivatives and things like that were not properly included. Um, the issue of marine genetic resources versus digital sequence information is being dealt with by the Convention on Biological Diversity at the moment, as well as other treaties like WHO, um, um, Food and Agriculture Organization, and others, uh, the new pandemic treaty, I think, as well. Uh, monetary versus non-monetary, again, the issues uh, there of how that was going to be dealt with. Uh, what the monetary, benefit, monetary benefits will be used for whether fish were to be included or excluded, and the notification system to be used, uh, so a prior notification system and the use of identifiers to follow materials uh, in a transparent way, and that traceability of materials and data is, is essential again. A lot of this could be dealt with by good science, and by referencing good scientific practice, you might be able to deal with many of these issues. And the financial mechanism is a separate issue, and again, I'm not, not an expert in this, but I will try and describe a little bit of what happened. So what actually happened at the time, uh, really it was, again, um, I, I only spent the last week at the treaty negotiations, and the issue again was a lot of time was being spent on an issue uh, around fish, and whether they were included or excluded, and there was no agreement on the Friday. And on the Monday, uh, late, uh, the Monday the 27th of February, there was still very little progress on the text. On the Wednesday, there was this compromise text proposed, and again, there was uh, there was really a rejection of that text on that day, and the EU proposed another text the next day. But finally, on Friday, as Lydia said, they carried on the negotiations from 9 a.m. till 11 p.m. on the Saturday, and at that point, they had an agreed text. It's, it's definitely worth just having a, a look at that. So we have this advanced text that was released on the Monday after, and then there was the currently uh, the current version of the text is also available, which has the paragraph renumbering and the technical edits to be agreed and the process. So what was really happening? Uh, really, at the moment, it will take some time to understand what is going on, but hopefully it will mean good scientific practice with limited additional procedures. And the kind of things I would like to point out is that if, if you read the text as it, as it stands now, you have a lot that is very consistent with Nagoya, including definitions that are concordant. Um, the good news on my, uh, uh, from my viewpoint is that the benefits are to be used for the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas in our national jurisdiction. I think that's critical that the money goes towards that. Fishing is excluded uh, in very convoluted text, as far as I can see, uh, except when used uh, for their genetic properties. Uh, notification uh, is to be done before a research cruise. Uh, 
uh, and provide you're provided by a, a DBNJ standardized batch identifier um, used for transparency. So basically, this is already standard practice, but there's no global uh, standard for uh, these identifiers. So again, that might be helpful to the scientific community. There will be obligations to deposit data and samples and make this available, and uh, that makes good scientific sense. Uh, but use those identifiers to enable databases to link materials and data. Uh, benefits will be based on payments into a fund uh, via assessed contributions and potentially other payments in the future uh, based on use of MGR. And again, that will rely on reliable baseline data and reliable, trace, uh, reliable data on uh, the size of the market in years to come. Um, there has to be reporting on the use of samples and data that is already a good, good scientific practice that you record the information in a publication in a database, but it becomes possible to, to transparently see where um, data has been stored, where materials are stored. The other important thing is that the inclusion of digital sequence information is, has been achieved, which is, which is the positive side of things. And there's this uh, implicit agreement to work together with other instruments, although it doesn't enumerate them. It, 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 we would think that means the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the World Health Organization uh, on this DSI. And I think this is critical because that needs to be at a, almost a, an instrument that, that lives above um, all of these treaties because DSI is so critical to the biotechnology and medical industries uh, globally. And there's to be a benefit sharing committee uh, set up as well. And again, we'd like to see how that works. And with that, I think I'll stop. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jaspers. Uh, well, probably some of the um, issues that you mentioned that are a little bit open uh, still. This was a very tough issue in the negotiations where we are uh, addressed by the, uh, as the benefit sharing committee, as you very well said. With this, uh, we will go to uh, Professor Papastavridis, uh, who will speak on implementation and enforcement and dispute settlement, very systemic um, provisions. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Bernada. And thank you for pronouncing my long Greek name perfectly. Um, and thank you very much to Bickle and especially, especially to Jack for a very kind invitation. Um, I will uh, you know, make a disclaimer. It's very difficult to speak after a, a Professor Jasper with a very, very nice and pictures PowerPoint. I'm, I'm a black letter lawyer, so I will refer only to, you know, provisions without any 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 PowerPoint. But I will try to to other support certain points and offer some comments on on which, are, you know, provision which I think will be key to the to the implementation and you know, effective um, uh, uh, living of the of this treaty. Uh, now, I mean, first of all, I think I share the view of all that, you know, after 19 years of, of negotiation, right, so everything started in 2004, and 2006 was the first ad uh, hoc meeting, but after so many years, we are very pleased, especially those who have been, you know, participated in uh, some of the sessions that this treaty has been adopted, right. Um, it's, and officially still it will be adopted, I think, in, in June, right, this coming June, uh, so we'll see how much, how long we take the ratification process and so on and so forth. Now, as all, all know, I mean, you know, even if a treaty is ratified, even if the treaty is set in under its force after six ratification, everything will depend on the implementation, right? And you know, it is it is it is my task to in the remaining eight minutes, nine minutes to see seven minutes to see what is what are the principles on the provision on implementation and also on dispute settlement. Now, on implementation, there is one provision that has to do with specifically with. Um, with the marine protected areas, with area-based panel advancement tools, which I think is, is, is interesting to note. It's Article 20, which is on the implementation uh, provision. So it is very roughly said that, you know, uh, that states are very broad, abstract reference to the obligation of states' parties to ensure the parts of the, the new agreement, to ensure that, you know, their measures, they will, that, that, the, that they were, every activity under the jurisdiction of control will be in accordance in, in compliance with uh, the provisions regarding and the measures regarding uh, MPAs, marine protect areas um, in the uh, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, interestingly, there is also a caveat uh, on paragraph two of Article 20, setting out that you know each state may take more stringent measures with respect to the flags, uh, flying their, their, uh, to the vessels flying their flag or to nationals, their nationals. This is. Article 20 that has to do with uh, specifically the implementation of uh, marine protected areas. 
Another provision, another set of provisions is Article 53, uh, which has to do with the implementation, generally speaking, of the Convention, which again, it's a very broad you know, uh, reference that the state shall take all necessary measures, legislative, administrative, uh, and policy measures to ensure compliance with the agreement. Um, the second uh, Article 53B uh, says that you know, there is uh, an, an obligation to report measures that the state has to do at, at intervals, which will be established by the conference of the parties. And also um, Article 53 ter, uh, establishes a, a, a compliance committee, an implementation compliance committee, uh, which is one of the mechanisms of institutional arrangements that this uh, new agreement uh, sets out. Now, a few thoughts on this. First of all, very basic, these are very basic provisions, both Article 53 and 20, a very basic fundamental obligation of conduct. State parts shall ensure. Right? Now, is this enough? Absolutely uh, not. Um, interestingly, and I think this was, uh, it's a good sign, there was reference to the, the you know, the, the cover, the disclaimer that states may take more measures when it comes to internationals and their flags, turn their vessels flying their flags. Uh, which is uh, which is welcome. I mean, you know, under international law, there is this is a very you know a well you know fundamental and well accepted uh, basis here to jurisdiction, right? So you can, of course, states may legislate, prescribe over uh, the conduct of its uh, nationals under the principle of nationality and its you know uh, the national of its vessels in the context of fisheries. We, for example, we have uh, the Article Thirty Nine of the European Union regulation on a legal and important regulated fishery, which actually you know, uh, sets out an obligation of states to control their nationals. So I think this is, it, is, it, it depends on the state to introduce legislation, internal legislation to actually uh, um, uh, make these provisions more, uh, give more teeth and uh, to these provisions. Um, however, I think we have missed some opportunities. And one opportunity is, is if, if we want to see this and juxtapose this new agreement with the previous one, with the Fistox Agreement, right, in 1995, the second implementing agreement under UNCLOS, there you can find when it comes to, you know, like, for example, RFMO measures or fisheries beyond national jurisdiction, which is closely linked, it's similar to what we are actually having here, they had, you know, a very robust enforcement mechanism. Um, under the Fistox Agreement, there is provision for flag state enforcement, for flag state inspection, you know, a reciprocal flag state, uh, the parties to, to the agreement will actually inspect vessels of another state part to the agreement, to the fish agreement, if they are, you know, in the high seas, if they are actually living up to their commitments, and also port state enforcement, right, under Article 23 of the uh, fish agreement. All these are missing here, both in terms of MPAs and in terms of general uh, implementation agreement and the general implementation of part. Now, um, also, when we talk about vast maritime areas, right, uh, that, you know, a maritime, maritime project area may be established, we can use other tools. Uh, in Oxford, we have a project in, on sustainable ocean project, which we try to, to, to evaluate, assess the effectiveness of satellites, of earth observation tools, like satellites or drones that can be used to, to survey vast ocean areas, right, and give information to, um, to uh, states that it can actually then enforce. So there is... All these are missing. Now, however, there is the, the good thing is that there is um, you know, a reference to the, the possibility of the conference of the parties under Article uh, 48 to, uh, first of all, to adopt measures or, or you know, recommendation with respect to implementation of this agreement. And also after five years, uh, specifically under Article 48, Paragraph uh, uh, 7, uh, the, the, COP, the conference of the parties may take measures that they will strengthen implementation. So we see whether also the, the environmental, the, sorry, the, the implementation committee may recommend to the conference of the parties the adoption of more stringent measures, uh, surveillance, enforcement tools that could actually be used in this regard. But this remains to be seen, and I think generally speaking, what the COP will do, I think, will be instrumental to the to to this, you know, the effective implementation of this agreement. Now, very fastly, I move up uh, only two three minutes to the, the dispute settlement provisions, right? Now there was, I was, was you know, after you know, having also as a as a prototype of the free stocks agreement, we expect that there will be certain dispute settlement arrangement, and there are there are under uh, Article 54 uh, onwards and 55, I think is the key one. 
that actually uh, sets out the you know the the the, the idea that you know every dispute concerning the interpretation or um, thank you Renata, uh, the interpretation and, and uh, enforcement and implementation of this agreement could be subject to dispute settlement. If you read the provisions, I won't go uh, through them in detail. This says it is a basic kind of you know dispute settlement logic that every state there are of course an obligation to um, uh, uh, resolve this so amicably. States are free. There's a free choice of means principle, so they can freely choose their own means to, to resolve disputes. There is reference to uh, you know disputes of, of a technical character, and then you know under Article 55 there is the idea of you know the the, the basic provision set, setting out that you know that the, all the disputes shall be subject to Part 15 of UNCLOS. So Part 15 is the dispute settlement part of UNCLOS. And as also happened in the under the Fish Stocks Agreement, you know there is you know this disputes could go to one of the four uh, dispute settlement fora under Article 287, which is the ITLOS, uh, uh, ICJ, application under Article 7, and application under Article 8. Now, this has not happened as of yet with respect to the Fish Stocks Agreement. We will see whether it will happen with respect to the new agreement. There's a couple of things that's interesting. It's the idea of the non-state parties to the convention. So let's say United States or Israel wants to sign up to the new treaty, which are not party uh, to the to the old to the you know 192 convention, they will be subject to the um to the pro to the dispute settlement provisions under Part 15, but they can actually choose their own means of the dispute settlement. However, there is a reference that they can also use what is uh, the optional exception of Article 298, which is which to me is a little bit striking, right? Because Article 298, in my at first, you know, on, on its face, doesn't have anything to do with BBNJ. Article 298 has to do with disputes with maritime delimitation, with military measures, and security council measures. So I don't know how this in, in practice will play out, how this will actually somehow, you know, protect states that they don't want to be, uh, you know, uh, subject to dispute settlement. Final point for NADA, I know this will close. Uh, the new treaty has actually assumed the trend, if I can use this word, and forgive me if I use this word, of advisor opinion. So under Article 48, Paragraph 6, there's a reference that the office of the parties may request an advisor opinion by ETHOS, right? Now we have a, a, a pending, you know, advisor opinion request for uh, climate change and, and outflows. We had the Fisher's advisor opinion in, 19, in 2015, a previous one on the seabed. I think it's a good sign because uh, the ethos has shown, you know, this, you know, inclination to be very progressive in, in reading UNCLOS, in actually reading evolutively the, the, the convention and, all, you know, and actually offering very good insights on, on, on how things should be done in respect of the environment. So it is, you know, I think it will remain to be seen how this will work. Um, this is a close on thank you. I'm sorry if I took one or more two minutes more of my time. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vastavridis. Uh, you will be surprised how well I can pronounce uh, Greek. Aristopoli. <laughs> so now we go to uh, Professor uh, Tanaka, who will go to the very specific but important aspect of the um, implications for Arctic Ocean governance uh, of this agreement. You have the floor, Professor. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, for your invitation to this uh, timely uh, event. I'd like to make a brief remarks on the implications of the environmental impact assessment procedures in the BBNJ agreement for the protection of the marine Arctic. In light of particular vulnerability of the Arctic environment, including marine biological diversity, the effective legal framework for promoting international cooperation is crucial in the protection of the marine Arctic. Nonetheless, as you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has significantly hampered international cooperation in the Arctic. Indeed, the Arctic Council has stopped all official meetings since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Prevention of international cooperation through the Arctic Council entails the serious risk of undermining the effectiveness of the protection of the marine Arctic. In response, I think that there is a need to explore alternatives to strengthen a legal framework for the protection of the marine Arctic. When concerning this issue, it seems to me that the implications 
of the new BBNG agreement for the protection of the marine environment merits further consideration. The general framework for governing the protection of the marine Arctic is provided by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and the general legal framework is amplified by global multilateral environmental treaties, such as the 1995 Fish Stocks Agreement and the Convention on Biological Diversity, and the regional environmental instruments, such as the uh, 2017 Polar Code and the 2018 Agreement to Prevent Unregulated High Seas Fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean. These uh, instruments constitute principal sources of the Arctic legal system concerning marine environmental protection. And in my view, the Arctic legal system is characterized by three elements. The first, in the Arctic legal system, there is no institutionalized machinery for formulating norms governing the Arctic. While a principal intergovernmental forum is provided by the Arctic Council, the Arctic Council isn't a legislative body, and the Council itself cannot adopt treaties. So legal instruments concerning the protection of the marine Arctic have been developed only in a piecemeal fashion. Second, in the Arctic legal system, there is no institutionalized machinery for adopting legally binding measures in the Arctic. And third, compliance procedures remains less developed in the Arctic legal system. Accordingly, compliance with norms governing the marine Arctic relies on the goodwill of states. All in all, the Arctic legal system can be regarded as a decentralized legal system. Accordingly, Originally, the Arctic legal system contains limitations with regard to timely formulation of environmental norms and measures and their effective implementation. My question is whether and how the BBNG agreement can contribute to reinforcing the Arctic legal system with a view to better protecting the environment of the marine Arctic. Noting this question, now uh, I'd like to briefly address part four of the BBNG agreement that provides detailed rules concerning an environmental impact assessment. Environmental impact assessment under the BBNG agreement can be characterized by particularly by four features. The first noteworthy feature concerns the elaboration of the obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment. Specifically, the BBNG agreement provides the obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment in areas beyond national jurisdiction, the obligation to conduct a transboundary environmental impact assessment, and strategic environmental assessment. It seems that the BBNJ agreement marks a milestone by providing a clear obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment in areas beyond national jurisdiction. It's also relevant that the BBNJ agreement includes uh, strategic environmental assessment, although the obligation under Article 41 tier is limited to consider conducting strategic environmental assessment. In this connection, it is remarkable that the BBNG agreement specifies the contents of environmental impact assessment in some detail. Indeed, elements for concluding conducting an environmental impact assessment are clarified by Article 24. Contents of environmental impact assessment reports are elaborated by Article 35. Given that the Law of the Sea Convention provides no further precision with regard to elements for conducting an environmental impact assessment, I think that this is a welcome development. The second noteworthy feature relates to the clarification of the process of environmental impact assessment. In the context of transboundary environmental impact assessment, the ICJ in Costa Rica versus Nicaragua, Nicaragua versus Costa Rica specified merely two stages of environmental impact assessment. That is the preliminary assessment and the environmental impact assessment. The article, uh, article 206 of the Law of the Sea Convention provides no detailed rules concerning the process of environmental impact assessment. By contrast, Article 30 of the BBNG agreement specifies the process of environmental impact assessment from screening to the publication of an environmental impact assessment report. 
The third node was the feature concerns ensuring transparency and accountability of environmental impact assessment. In the context of environmental impact assessment, transparency is crucial with a view to ensuring timely public access to information used in the assessment and the process of environmental impact assessment itself. It's a prerequisite to verify accountability, which aims at reasons, decisions. In this regard, it's notable that the BBNJ agreement provides the uh, clearing house mechanism with a view to ensuring transparency. Finally, but not least, control of environmental impact assessment by third bodies merits mention. Ensuring the legitimacy of environmental impact assessment necessitates the involvement of impartial third party in the process of assessment. In this regard, scientific and technical body performs multiple functions in the process of environmental impact assessment, such as to consider and evaluate and make comments on the draft environmental impact assessment report, and to consider and evaluate the potential impact of the planned activity when concerns were legislated by a party. The COP also performs important functions in a particular context of environmental impact assessment. Under Article 38, Paragraph 4, for instance, at the request of a party, the COP is allowed to provide advice and assistance to that party when determining whether a planned activity under its jurisdiction or control may proceed. The central part of the Marine Arctic remains the high seas, so the BBNJ agreement applies to the high sea part of the Marine Arctic. Although the scope of the continental shelf beyond the 200 nautical miles remains undetermined in the Arctic Ocean, it appears that some parts of the seabed would constitute the area. So the BBNJ agreement is also applicable to the area in the Marine Arctic. Once BBNJ agreement entered into force among states involving Arctic activities, to a certain extent at least, it would appear that the environmental impact assessment procedures under the BBNJ agreement could contribute to addressing the weakness of the Arctic legal system. Here, I'd like to make three points. First, the Marine Arctic is increasingly accessible owing to climate change. So it's foreseeable that activities in the Marine Arctic would increase. It appears that the elaboration of the obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment would be useful to prevent adverse impacts of the activities on the Marine Arctic. Second, by clarifying the process of environmental impact assessment, the BBNJ agreement can contribute to the institutionalization of environmental impact assessment in the Marine Arctic. In this regard, what is particularly important concerns the control of environmental impact assessment process by third bodies. As I said earlier, the BBNJ agreement introduces control of the process of environmental impact assessment by the scientific and technical body and the COP. The involvement of third bodies would be useful with a view to enhancing the effectiveness of environmental impact assessment in the Marine Arctic, limiting discretions of states. The third and the last point concerns the enhancement of the rule of indigenous peoples and local communities. In the Arctic, there are various indigenous peoples and they constitute around 10% of the Arctic population. Indigenous, indigenous peoples are one of the key actors in the Arctic. Interestingly, the BBNJ agreement repeatedly stresses the need for the conservation of relevant traditional knowledge of indigenous people and local communities in the context of environmental impact assessment. So I think that the uh, BBNG agreement can open the way to enhance the rule of indigenous peoples and local communities in the process of environmental impact assessment. This is my brief observation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Tanaka. Um... And with this overview, we have some questions uh, from the floor. And because time is limited, if I'm allowed, um, I will try to mix them with some other uh, questions for you. So um, the first question is for Dr. Papastavridis. With regard to um, 
whether there is or not a gap in the in the treaty with regard to liability or compensation for environmental damage caused to areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, whether environmental law, and I would add international law, is enough today, or whether it should be further developed. And in with regard to this question, maybe for you, I would like to add um, the, the question is, um, you were puzzled with regard to the um, provisions on a dispute settlement. This is an, uh, these are areas that might not entail the traditional type of bilateral disputes. So, um, you know, the role of the CBED dispute chamber was very special and is not replicated. So in that regard, and with regard also to um, liability, do you see a possible enhanced role for ITLOS through advisory opinions? Because it has been progressive, in particular in what regards to um, the common heritage of mankind. That will be the first question, and then we'll go to the other speakers. Uh, thank you very much, Bernada, and thanks uh, to the uh, Musara Mari for the for the question. It's a very interesting question. So very briefly, um, there is, yes, it is a noticeable gap in the treaty that there is no primary obligation for liability for compensation as it is in other kinds of treaties with respect to environmental law. Therefore, we should, what we should you know, refer back to the, to the default rules of firstly state responsibility, right? So there is, if there is, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, damage caused, injury caused by a particular state in violation of its primary obligation of the treaty, it will be law of uh, reparation. So who is going to actually invoke that? This is a very interesting question. We have the time to, 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 uh, to address this. Um, I think the whole BBNJ process and dispute settlement, and also going to Fernanda's question, is, is you know, is what we are teaching as, law, as you know, uh, international lawyers about obligations erga omnes, obligations erga omnes partners, because there's no a directly injured state when it comes to these kind of areas. So everybody, in principle, will have a legal interest in bringing a case for, let's say, a violation. Every party to the agreement, uh, at last, at least, will have a, you know, um, a, um, the legal interest and the the, the power to bring, a, a, you know, a either state dispute probably in uh, under Part 15. Also, um, it might be uh, as a liability, you know, the environmental. The implementation committee under Article 53 may also propose, you know, in the sense of, you know, it does have a, a binding nature, but may propose to the state party that has actually caused damage, the, you know, any, you know, recommend the compensation to uh, uh, for this uh, for this damage caused by its activity, and then of course it's Italos. So Italos may have this, and Italos has done this uh, job in in terms of uh, the in the 2011. Advisor opinion on the seabed. So the, the state sponsoring, for example, uh, marine genetic resource uh, voyage or enterprise will have this, you know, obligation to um, uh, remedy any damage that have happened to, to the environment. So in, in 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 short, there is a gap. It might be rectified in the future in terms of the the, the comps of the parties recommending more measures. But I think we have uh, for the time being we have to, you know. Hope that you know there will be a you know the ITLOS may take a, a more a, a pro, you know proactive role. The, the implementation committee can take this role, and also we'll look forward to an, maybe an interstate dispute that might happen, and this will also clarify the issue of legal interest in this regard. Hope I answered the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a, a couple of uh, questions from the same person, and we will go for first for the whether. Um, in terms of adopting an ecosystem approach or ecosystem resilience approach, how how is it seen or justified the exception of fish, uh, let's say to be more accurate, fishing, if that is a political concession? And on this one, um, I probably I would go to uh, Professor uh, Jaspers. And then we'll go to the more legal parts of it. And I'm not sure we dealt with this in, in the panel, but maybe we can uh, go to that. Professor Jaspers. I think Lydia University. wants to answer this one uh, first. I think it's probably better. Lydia, go ahead. 
Yeah, thanks. So I think it's important to recognize that this um, exemption for um, regulated fishing and fishing as commodities, um, this is under the uh, part on marine genetic um, resources. So this is not applying to the treaty as a whole. Um, yes, the, there was discussion about whether fish should be within the scope of the treaty as a whole, and it came out that um, as long as it you know, is is narrowly um, the regulation of fishing is is narrowly developed to not undermine existing fisheries um, organizations. This agreement can um, have some influence on fishing. The exemption for fishing under the marine genetic resources and sharing of benefits section is intended to do two things. First, it's intended to distinguish between fishing fish as commodities and fish as genetic resources. And this is something that we've dealt with in implementation of the Nagoya Protocol for a long time. The thing is, when we're talking about benefit sharing in relation to genetic resources, we don't want to cast such a wide net in our regulation that we are trying to regulate you know, the entire fishing industry or any kind of use of biological resources that is intended for use as a commodity, um, because that's going to be overly broad. It's not going to be so applicable. It's going to create a burden on these industries. And these industries are normally regulated elsewhere by other provisions that are, are more appropriate for addressing the impacts, that, the environmental impacts that they can have. The other thing that this part is trying to do is it's trying to not undermine existing um, regional or sectoral organizations. And this, again, was just a through line through the negotiations. We already have a lot of regimes and a lot of organizations that are operating in areas beyond national jurisdiction that have mandates and um, authority to regulate certain activities. And this treaty shouldn't, shouldn't be in a place to undermine those existing organizations. It should support them and help to coordinate. Thank you very much, Lydia. Uh, I guess Dr. Jaspers has something to add, and maybe he could also refer to a uh, reference in Article 11.2 with regard to access um, in accordance with international practice. Does that mean that is completely free, uh, no limits? And, and then we will finally go to Professor Papastavridis and Professor Tanaka quickly. Please, mm -hmm. Professor Jaspers. I'm happy with Lydia's answers on um, fish. I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm happy that, that that's, that's answered very clearly here. But my my um, knowledge is indeed about uh, digital sequence information and this idea of in, in accordance with current international practice is interesting. Um, a lot of that is to do with how digital sequence information is dealt with in terms of deposition and access. Um, and that shouldn't be restricted. And it's been discussed at the moment underneath the, um, the CBD and also under Global Biodiversity um, Forum. Uh, and that is important because it's such an important tool and so that there shouldn't be restricted access to the materials and it, neither should the databases be fragmented. So the key is that the decision that was made in uh, mid-December at the CBD uh, in Montreal was for that particular type of work um, and a particular kind of sharing on digital things information should be indeed across all, um, in my mind, it should be across all of the different instruments, not separate. And it should be according to the, the, the principles that were stated by the, the, the delegates there, uh, that it should be very efficient, uh, feasible and practical, and it should be effective. It should, be, it should not hinder research and innovation and be consistent with open access to data. So these are the kind of principles, the scientific principles on which that is based. And I think that many scientists feel that the CBD decision was a very good one and that it, it should really apply to other treaties too, because it is such an important aspect of, of current scientific research. And indeed for any kind of work being done right now on biodiversity conservation, as well as the use of biodiversity for uh, sustainable uses such as bioprospecting. So I think it's critical that it's done. So I think this, this pays heed to that particular fact and that the fact that the CBD decision was made, but it's not being uh, operationalized yet. So we're waiting for that. And as soon as, uh, hopefully it will go well. And once it's operational, uh, it will be possible for the Vivian Day Treaty to fit into that particular type of, of way of using of science in the in most useful way. Thank you very much. We are running out of time, but uh, I would really like if our organizers uh, agree to give the floor to Professor Tanaka with um, a very simple question. Um, of my own, 
Uh, a good part of what is there on environmental impact assessment, you are aware, comes from the Antarctic Treaty, which is probably in organizational and governance uh, structure, um, I would say the opposite to the Arctic Council. So um, do you think it would be useful for uh, the COP to follow how environmental impact assessment take place in practice in the Antarctic Treaty? Because there is a scientific committee, but it's not exactly um, independent. Uh, it is impartial, but not independent because member states are there. So, so what, what do you think could be useful to follow from the Antarctic Treaty in order um, to regulate better how this is going to take place? Hmm. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting question. And the, actually, I, I'm also uh, thinking about uh, that question, but the, uh, uh, I cannot have an immediate answer. And the, actually, the, uh, the Antarctic Treaty System has its own uh, environmental protocol and its own the, uh, procedures for uh, environmental impact assessment. So the, I think that the, here, the, an issue uh, will arise with re regard to the relationship between the BB Energy Agreement and the Antarctic Treaty uh, System, in particular, the Environmental uh, uh, Madrid Protocol. So the, this would be uh, dealt with by Article 23 of the BB Energy Agreement. So the, I think that the, uh, this issue uh, will, uh, 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 will be left to the further uh, consideration on the application, how to apply Article 23 of the BB Energy Agreement. I think that the similar uh, issue may arise, for instance, in the uh, North East Atlantic. The, the, there is the OSPA uh, convention, and there is the, uh, the procedure of environmental impact assessment. So the, here, again, the relationship may uh, the issue may arise with regard to the uh, relationship between the BB Energy Agreement and the regional uh, instruments. So the, uh, yeah, it's a, a quite interesting question. So the, uh, uh, I'd like to consider this uh, question uh, further by comparing the, uh, the procedures of BB Energy Agreement and the Madrid Protocol. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much. And uh, the last response will come from Professor Papastafridis with regard to the question of the already patented uh, organisms. And maybe I would like to just to finalize uh, this section um, to make it wider. And, and to, to try to foresee what the role of the conference of the parties uh, is going to be with regard to, broadly speaking, not only already existing patents, but the question of patenting that is not very clear in the agreement, and the question of related question of patenting of living resources, not only uh, processes and products, but also of living resources themselves, which was a big issue and, and it's not really very specific. And this is going to be the last uh, question to be responded. Professor Papastavridis. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, uh, when it comes to your, your final question remark, I, I, I echo that this is, you know, it is uh, IP and patenting is left outside of the convention of the treaty. And this is, I think, wise in terms of, you know, because it is another, you want to undermine, you know, the, the you know the effectiveness or other work of other kind of you know instruments when it comes to uh, uh, marine energy resources. Uh, I think that there is, uh, uh, as I, as I, as I told us in my presentation, there is a lot of in, in on, the, on the hands of the COP. So the the you know the resilience and the effectiveness of the, of the you know of the new treaty will I think like heavily depend on how COP will operate and how COP how courageous and how you know states will be. You know, uh, amenable to to actually um, uh, have this kind of you know corporate having a very active role. I don't know really. I don't know about this. Um, so, uh, with respect to, to patenting, I'm I'm not sure what will happen when it comes to the question uh, of sovereignty issues. Uh, first of all, I was amazed and didn't know about this um, this particular bacteria. So this is something a new knowledge for me. Uh, but you know, I don't know how we can actually have an, a sovereignty over a resource. But you know what is on the face of the, the new agreement when it comes to sovereignty issues. I think that the, 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 the you know the the negotiators, the drafts were very very cautious on actually excluding any sovereignty issue out of the you know dispute settlement uh, procedure. So if you read Article 53, 
55, excuse me, says that everything has to do with sovereignty, with sovereign right, jurisdiction over areas, everything should be excluded. However, I mean, as, as uh, you know, lawyers know, and, and, and you know, people in the audience know, I mean, all depends on how you, when there's a dispute settlement, how you frame the question. So, right, how you frame the subject matter of the dispute. So if the dispute is a sovereignty part is, is, is an artillery or is not the main subject matter of, uh, uh, you know, bilateral dispute, this could end up for a tribunal under part 15, let's say uh, the South China Sea case. On the other hand, I mean, if this is, you know, this can be construed as giving rise to a really uh, a sovereignty issue, I think the drafts are very cautious to exclude any of these kind of disputes. Right, but I think it's it, you know it remains to be seen how this dispute settlement provision will will be implemented. Uh, you know, if you take a thing into mindful of what happened with the fish stocks agreement, this was there has been no case so far uh, with respect to fish stocks agreement disputes coming under Part 15. So we'll we'll see how it works. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Papastavridis. Uh, it is clear. Um, with regard to the, um, all the presentations, if you look at the agreement, there's many aspects of what is provided for in the agreement that are still pending of resolution and determination. It may vary according to negotiations at the meetings of the uh, conference of the parties and the work of the uh, subsidiary uh, committees that the agreement has created. So with this, I would like to... Um, I thank Bickel for organizing and, of course, all the presenters for very in-depth considerations. Uh, very interesting. Uh, it's an issue to continue to follow. So thanks so much and, and thanks for the honor of being the chair of this wonderful panel. Uh, with this, uh, thank you all for participating to um, all participants to uh, this uh, event and for the questions and, and the attentive follow follow up uh, to you over to you Jack thank you very much thank you very much uh, to all of our panelists um, and also thank you very much to our chair thank you Fernanda for doing such an excellent job uh, managing the discussion uh, that's all from us here and um, as I mentioned please keep an eye out for an, the event report which should be published uh, in the next week or so on our website thank you very much everyone Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Have a nice evening. Day. Bye -bye. Take care.